mentioned at the start of the previous video on Nicky Lauda's fiery crash, I seem to have done more videos on the driver safety stuff than any other topic over the entirety of the motorsport world. And people actually said on that previous video, I'm glad that you're doing these kind of videos because it shows how far the thing has come. So I'm doing a good job. In my mind. But it is crazy because in my lifetime there have been three deaths in Formula One. By the time my dad was my age, 33 if you're curious, there had been 38. 11 of those had occurred in the first four years of his life. My dad had grown up through the golden years of the sport, so the likes of Jim Clark, Graham Hill, Jackie Stewart, Jack Brabham, Jackie X, Denny Holm, Lotus, Cooper, BRM, Matra, and by comparison, my Formula 1 experience is sanitised. In a good way. Imagine if people were killed now as often as they were then, with all this TV stuff and sponsor stuff and the sheer money involved. It'd be shut down. But today I'd like to look at the 19th death on that list, and that is Lorenzo Bandini, who suffered fatal injuries at the 1967 Monaco Grand Prix. 1967 is a season that will be in the history books for two main reasons. Number one, it's the season replicated in that epic racing simulation Grand Prix Legends. If you've never played it, go to the search bar and type in GP Laps Grand Prix Legends and just absorb it. After this video has ended, obviously. It was a game that captured the essence of that time, a time when Formula 1 was still at its core, a mighty dangerous endeavour that saw man and machine get pushed to limits nobody thought were possible. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again because it is relevant. This is the time that there was an engineering explosion on this little blue ball that we float around on. Supersonic jet aircraft were shooting each other down in Vietnam, and the development of heat-seeking missiles meant that the close combat dogfighting seen during World War II with just guns had now been rendered obsolete. And now the age of fire and forget had dawned, meaning aircraft could engage further away. Then there's the space race. The Soviets had already by 1967 sent Yuri Gagarin up into space, and the United States was aiming to have a man on the moon by the end of the decade. In the April of 1967, the USSR had the first space fatality when Vladimir Komarov was killed when his Soyuz 1 encountered mid-flight control problems and crashed. And it wasn't just the military and space, because the era of jet travel had begun. The Boeing 737, 727 were in service, the 707 had ushered in the new transatlantic jet age, cutting journey times between Europe and the United States to just hours. At the same time, the British, French and Russians were working on supersonic jet airliners, Concorde and the Tu-144, which was often called Concordsky due to it being effectively a copy of Concorde, supposedly through industrial espionage. And finally, there's Formula One. In 1966, the FIA changed the rules regarding the construction of the cars. Out were the 1.5 litre engines and they had now doubled the engine capacity, so top speeds increased, records fell overnight, and in 1966, Jack Brabham became the first and so far only man to win the world championship in his own car. Bruce McLaren and Dan Gurney would also become owner drivers, a concept that was later followed by the likes of Graham Hill and John Surtees. Among others, I haven't forgotten anybody, this is just a sample. Jim Clark's Lotus in 1965 had a 1.5 litre engine that chucked out about 200 horsepower. In 1966, the Ferrari V12s were nudging somewhere in the region of 350. So now, in 1966, these cars were putting out an insane amount of power for what they were. And because the cars were supposed to only be 500 kilos, at least the minimum weight was supposed to be 500 kilos, power to weight figures were through the roof. The season had started in South Africa at the Kyle Army Circuit on the 2nd of January 1967, and this race was won by Pedro Rodriguez in the Maserati-powered Cooper while behind him was the Rhodesian John Love, who raced under three nationalities in his time in Formula 1. Between 1962 and 1964, he raced under the flag of the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland, but that federation dissolved in 1963, and the northern half of the country split into what is now Zambia and Malawi. The southern remaining part became simply Rhodesia, using a new light blue-based flag. But in 1965, the country declared independence from the United Kingdom and in 1968 adopted a new green and white flag, with Love racing under that flag between 1969 and 1972. In 1979, the country was renamed Rhodesia Zimbabwe, and then in 1980, just simply Zimbabwe. It's all very confusing. I think the whole thing was kicked off initially by Mozambique declaring its independence from Portugal and then Malawi doing something else. And yeah, it's all very confusing and you know, colonial history often is, but at least it's the history of one of the more obscure nationalities that has raced in Formula 1 over the years, so I hope you've learned something on that front. Lotus, meanwhile, had struggled at this opening round. They were still waiting on their new engine from Cosworth and were running the short-lived and utterly terrible BRM H16 and whatever else they could get their hands on. 
Graham Hill had retired at South Africa due to an accident, while Clark's engine had blown up. For the Monaco Grand Prix in May, which would be the second round of the season, Clark would be given a Climax V8, while Hill had a BRM V8. What's also interesting to note here is that in the 1967 South African Grand Prix, which was the first at Kyle Army, only six drivers finished, Brabham and Horn being the only key players in the season to finish that race with Brabham four laps down on the leaders. So then the circus moves on to Monaco with only 17 Formula 1 drivers on the entry list, so they had to fill the numbers out with a couple of match from Formula 2 cars, which was pretty common at this time that Formula 2 cars would join the grid with Formula 1 cars. And it was basically multi-class at that point, but it wasn't treated in the same way. Clark's V8 that he'd been given for this event was only a 2 litre, but it made sense here because unlike at Kyle Army, which had a big, long start-finish straight, Monaco was completely the opposite and any car running 12 cylinders or being of a higher displacement up to that 3 litre cap had no real advantage over anybody else, so running a smaller lighter engine would be of benefit. In fact, most of the top teams had entered cars with smaller engines, mostly 2 or 2.5 litre engines for that balance between power and lightness, but Honda still brought a V12 and it was going to be the first Monaco Grand Prix for Dan Gurney's Anglo-American races. And the layout of Monaco was quite different to how it is now. There was no swimming pool complex. There was no Raskas, no Anthony Nogue's corner at the end. The final third of the circuit looked a lot different. The run from to back to the final corner was one long curve, where drivers had to slam on the brakes for the Gasworks hairpin that was tighter than the hairpin down by the Fairmont Hotel, that's the slowest corner currently in Formula 1. And actually, while on the subject, that corner didn't have a hotel there in 1967, it had a railway station. The chicane as well was a simple left-right flick, a chicane that was a test of nerve as well as car control that needed the driver to trust in the car to do what it needed to do. It's also the spot where Alberto Ascari had his famous accident in the 1950s where he crashed and ended up in the harbour, like actually in the water. But thankfully, because seatbelts weren't a thing back then, some boats that were in the harbour were able to pluck the Italian out of the water, mostly unscathed. The rest of the track was pretty much as it is today. Sander Vogt was a little bit different, but when you look at it from the point of view of a video game that's set around the time or has the older layout in, it's, well, you know where you're going. You don't need to learn anything different. It's not like Silverstone or the Nürburgring or any of those places, but the dangers were still there. Armco? What Armco? If you went off, you were on the curb, like actually on the curb, like the pavement that's out there. And if you went too far even still, you're wrapped around one of the streetlights. Even though the average speeds at Monaco were much lower than any other circuit, the dangers were still very real, especially since ending up in the water was a possibility, and now the drivers were starting to wear seatbelts. Brabham's Brabham was on pole for this race, with Lorenzo Bandini in the Ferrari in second, seven tenths off. Surtees in the V12 Honda was third, followed by Holm, Clark, Stewart, Gurney, Hill, Siffert and McLaren. Only 16 drivers made the start, as Bob Anderson in a Brabham, Jean-Pierre Beltoise in the F2 Matra, and Richard Ginther in the second of the two Eagles didn't qualify, even though they'd set times faster than Rodriguez, who brought up the rear of the field. This is because Monaco often ran to different rules compared to the rest of the championship. It's a bit like how the Indy 500 was run to USAC rules or something like that for a long time. What happened at Monaco is that only 16 cars were allowed to start the race, and race organisers gave invitation entries to anybody that had been building cars for the last three years. Any new teams had to scrap over what was left, so those scrapping teams being McLaren and the AARs. So this is how it worked. Looking here at the bottom end of the qualifying table, you've got the BRMs of Spence and Courage, then the Ferrari of Eamon, and the Coopers of Rint and Rodriguez. So these were classed as invitational entries, so they were on the grid irrespective of what time they set. So if you're Richard Ginther, he had to be faster than Johnny Servot's Gavin to get on the grid. Anderson, under normal rules, would have been 14th. Yeah, it's an utterly ridiculous way of doing things, it's almost like the 25-8 rule, and it's not the first time Monaco had done something like this either. Brabham's pole time was two seconds faster than what Bandini had done the year before, at exactly the same layout of the circuit, so it was sort of proving how fast these cars were evolving and how dangerous they were going to become. They also had three practice sessions to set their best time, so they had the three practice sessions, whichever the best time was set in, that was the time they used. It's a little bit how they did in the two session qualifying format, although practice and qualifying were the same session. But also something to note here is that the top four were three litre cars, so so much for two and a half or two litre being sort of on par with them at this point. The race got going and Bandini went off into the lead. 
Brabham, meanwhile, hit issues almost immediately as his engine went pop and started spewing oil everywhere, and he then spun with McLaren and Siffert having to dive out of the way. Brabham continued to spray oil all over the track with Clark going off on it, and then Brabham retired at Mirabeau as the Repco finally gave in. Clark would go off again on the oil on lap two and drop to the back of the field, and Holman Stewart passed Bandini as he slipped on the oil a little bit later on. Stewart would be out of the race on lap 14 as his differential broke, so that put Horn back into the lead with Bandini in hot pursuit. The retirements over the course of the race are listed on your screen. Brabham went first, followed by Servots Gavin, then Gurney, Rint, Stewart, Siffert, Surtees, and Clark. Clark falling victim to Lotus fragility again because his suspension broke at to back. And then Pierce Courage went on lap 64 with 35 laps or so left to run, and it was still anybody's race as Bandini was now starting to close in on Holm. Yes, this race ran to 100 laps. As a fun extra fact, Clark was seen helping the marshals clean up the broken bits of his Lotus before he went back to the pit lane. The thing was, Holm was physically fitter than Bandini, and by lap 70 or so, Holm had started to pull back out on the Ferrari as Bandini started making little mistakes, his concentration starting to fade. He was being untidy and ragged in some of the corners. 12 laps later though, tragedy. Bandini crashed at the chicane, and there wasn't just a small fire, the car was well and truly up. It was like a bomb had gone off. What had happened was Bandini had clipped the inside of the right hand part of the chicane, washed wide, hit the straw bales on the outside of the chicane and been stopped by a mooring head that was just behind those bales. The Ferrari flipped over and basically blew up like a light switch had been switched on. The combination of the fuel and the dry straw caused an inferno that burned with Bandini still inside of the car and it was one of those moments where something happened and nobody was equipped enough to deal with it. But it wasn't just the Ferrari on fire because the straw bales had been ignited from the impact point up to where the Ferrari had come to a stop, a good 10 or 12 yards or so, and thick black smoke was going up into the air. As was the case back then, the race continued. Drivers drove past the wreckage while firefighters tried to extract Bandini from the car. None of this was helped by the fact that there was a helicopter filming the race, and the downdraft from this helicopter was literally helping to fan the flames. When the fire was eventually out and Bandini extracted, the helicopter ended up reigniting the fire. Chris Amon then suffered a puncture that dropped him behind Graham Hill, the puncture probably caused by running over something at the chicane. Holm would cross the line at the end of the 100 laps, but this victory would be overshadowed by what had happened at the chicane. Graham Hill would be second, followed by Amon and McLaren, meaning that there were three Kiwis in the top four, and those three drivers accounting for a third of all New Zealanders to race in Formula 1. Motorsport Magazine wrote at the time that the English were starting to lose their grip on Formula 1, with how good some of these Australian and Kiwi drivers were. Three days later though, Bandini would succumb to his injuries and pass away at a hospital in Monaco. He'd got third degree burns over 70% of his body and had also broken several ribs. And the news had come through as a lot of the star drivers had gone over to Indianapolis to participate in the Indy 500, which was at the end of that month of May. It was also the last time that Formula 1 would run a race to 100 laps at Monaco. Straw bales for corner protection would also be gone as Formula 1 sought to replace them with tyre barriers and proper barriers over the next few years, as well as accelerating the development of proper flame retardant clothing. On top of this, TV cameras on helicopters were no longer allowed to fly in close proximity of accidents. Holm would only taste victory champagne twice all season, the next time being at the German Grand Prix, which might put him in the top two or three of the least races won on the way to taking the title. While Lotus would finally get the Cosworth DFV for the next round at Zandvoort, the Brabham proved to be more reliable, and Holm's consistent scoring over the rest of the season proved valuable to becoming the only New Zealander to win the World Championship, with Brabham securing the second constructors in a row. It was also a crash that was ironic in a sense because it was Lorenzo Bandini who suggested to the creators of the film Grand Prix, which was filmed over the course of 1966, to have a crash at the exit of the chicane. The scene where one of the cars ends up in the harbour and the other one that's involved ends up doing a wall ride you know, through the escape road of the chicane. It's a really great scene. It's online if you want to go and watch it. But it's just ironic that he would suggested this scene, which was probably the best part of the film at least in 1966 it was brilliant how it was filmed and then 12 months later he goes and has an accident on the exit of that chicane which proves to be fatal enzo wouldn't have a full-time replacement for bandini mike parks and ludovico scarfiotti would have a car for the next two rounds alongside Eamon, but parks would break his legs at spa and scarfiotti would go into retirement as a result of parks accident 
Jonathan Williams would have a car for the final round in Mexico, but for the vast majority of the season, Eamon would be Ferrari's only driver. There's a reason why that BBC documentary is called The Killer Years. So then, a look at the tragic death of Lorenzo Bandini at Monaco in 1967. If you've learned something new here today, then do like the video so I know I've done a good job and taught you something. And if you want to see more stuff from this channel, get subscribed with that bell on so you never miss out on anything I do around here. Massive thanks to the kind folk at Patreon that continue to support the channel at a more personal level. And if you want to help join in, there is a link to Patreon in the description along with my affiliate link. So if you buy something, I get a little bit of a kickback. And if you want to join as a channel member, there's a button underneath the video along with a button for super thanks if you just want to do a one and done tip. Also in the description, there's a link to Discord and to my socials if you just want to connect there. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward. Have a cracking day wherever you live in the world and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.